There we go. Okay, so was uh, we we in our class the other day we talked about uh, on Thursday we talked about uh, a few people and just kind of finding some finding some stories of of inspiration, true truthful inspirations, right? Because it's hard to it's hard to be able to say like, hey, uh, you can you can you can live a normal life, you can uh, you can excel you can succeed your dreams can come true it's hard to say that sometimes if you don't if you've never seen it happen right like if you've never seen a patient that actually um or a person that actually had kidney failure then uh went through the the treatment therapy you know dialysis and went through all the diet and stuff and and managed to still like work their whole life right like uh, their life plan college uh career and creativity and and relationships you know can you imagine like you have kidney failure and the, and you are like in the stage of life where you're courting or mm -hmm. or being courted um you know by by people that are are you know seeking to be your partner in life <laughs> yeah. uh, or, or or maybe you're wanting a partner in life and you know what it would do to to your person to your confidence to your your social life um your perception of self to to have kidney failure so tell me what you guys found joanne looked at at nancy hewitt space tell us a little bit joanne yeah um nancy is the uh, like longest survivor of kidney tra transplant and she has like 60 years of living with kidney failure mm -hmm. So what what else did you find out about her? Um oh, excuse me guys. Yeah, I think that's it. What 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 where where is she at now? I mean, she does dialysis or what? No, she already passed away. Nancy passed away? Yeah. January 14th of this year. Mm -hmm. Oh my god. You guys just told me news. I yeah, I thought that would be news to you. Yeah. Oh my god. Wow. Yeah. That's uh because when you look her up under Google, it says uh Nancy obituaries. Wow, I hadn't heard of this. Yeah. That's crazy. Oh my god. So yeah, she uh who are we talking about? Nancy who? Nancy, Nancy. Hewitt. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's bad to give you the news like this. <laughs> yeah, that's... Uh, I, yeah, mean, I noticed that when you were talking about her in the last class, you were talking her, uh, about her as a presence when you said, look at how they live. Yeah. And then when I saw that, I was like, I don't think you knew about that. No, I didn't. So her and Bill, Bill, uh, I didn't mention this guy, Bill Peckham. Mm -hmm. uh, he passed away recently as well. They're from the same area, same kidney center, Northwest Kidney Centers. Mm -hmm. And Bill was like well known as like the guy who does solo di dialysis with his dog. <laughs> he, mm. he did it himself at home nancy was right around him and she um she had kidney failure at a, a pretty young age um lived near the university ended up doing uh um what do you call this home she went through the committee she ended up you know the death committee or the life or death committee she uh, ended up doing home dialysis and doing it for extended periods of time and preached about how that's the way dialysis should be done because she had she had done it for the long periods of time and then also done it on a standard regimen and she said like it's night and day if every if everybody got a chance to do it for long periods of time that they would choose that because they feel so much better so much more normal their blood values are so much no more normal so she was like we should start out that way and if people want to go the other way that's on them but like it's it's kind of like People get used to feeling shitty. 
<laughs> yeah, you know what, what was so amazing about her? Um, I was very inspired by her. Um, she decided to do it at night. Yeah. You know, which is something that you're mentioning. And then she went back into snow skiing. <laughs> and and I was I was I was looking at her and uh she, the story that she has was um you know like in 81 was her first transplant and she even says where she got the transplant from a woman who fell off a ladder. <laughs> and then in 89 she got her third transplant from a motorcycle accident. Uh, that's a little scary for for me, but um, mm. uh, and then I guess at both times in eighty six and ninety five, both the transplants failed, and then in two thousand she got a fourth one. But I was trying to see when the second one was because I'm trying to see how many years that she went af far apart before she she you know like just to learn a little bit more about it. But it mm -hmm. doesn't mention the second transplant anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I haven't seen it either. Um, yeah, so and, it was, and it was, yeah. that's what I was trying to draw to Joanne was that she was living with the transplant and mm -hmm. uh, wow I'm sorry you guys like yeah kind of kind of took me yeah for a minute there she was she was a friend you know um and and somebody that that when I talk like this to to folks like you that she was always willing to to share her story with you know with me to better uh, elaborate to you guys, or even among groups, like she, she had spoke before national groups for me before, um, shared some of her, her stories and her pictures from around the world. Um, so you, you'll see her as we, as we talk about, uh, as we talk about things. Yeah. It's really recent. Uh, all right. Yeah. So, so yeah, we found Nancy and, um, she did, she lived, uh, along and, uh, we can say like a normal life, right? She, um, did. she became a, a, a nurse and a school nurse and a world renowned speaker and uh, motivated people to, to live healthy, but then also um, thoughtful lives when they get in, in position of chronic illness. Mm -hmm. what, uh, so Anthony, what we did was we were just talking about people and, 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 and how like you might be able to start gathering stories for your, your bag of tools um in in sharing with other patients like you can have a normal life as a uh oh, well, meet your I, goals I find know, related to it. a famous you know singer selena gomez she had yeah. lupus and she had yeah. failure and she needed a transplant her best friend gave her one yep yeah. yes yeah. and that was a, a pretty trialing uh process for the donor as well from yes. what i she had complication right yes yeah, yeah. So, so hi, Laura. Good morning. Who, who, what else did you guys find? We we just talked about Nancy Hewitt's faith, Laura. Um, did you? The fact that she put that the fact that she stayed at home while her husband completed school to become a physician with the two kids that she had, and and just she just kept living like a looking listening to her story. I mean, she she had such a long biography and it was so detailed. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And I, I just find it very touching, you know, even working in the hospital when people are getting any kind of transplant and they mention the person that they got it from. That to me is important. Yep. Um, so I just I, I was I, yeah, I was very inspired by her. Yeah, she she definitely was a, a person that you'll remember. Like <clears throat> in the last 10 years, I guess she was traveling less. So I didn't see her as much because um, we saw we see each other in the the conventions and stuff like this right um but but as far as like speaking on just events like this probably every day she was doing something like talking to a group of uh students or a group of patients or a group of doctors um sharing her story and and really advocating for um just better utilization of options in dialysis so how about any of the other players we talked about uh Chad Ireland amazing right. amazing tell us about him um I uh San Diego has one of those um iron marathon you know triathlons and I was a massage therapist for a while uh doing um the sports therapy on the marathon runners Mm. and I would watch them all the time I just got exhausted <laughs> just watching them swimming, running, biking. And the fact that he 
the fact that he did that and was very inspired, the only thing that I think in the story that kept him going was his professor yeah. at, the, the, at the Metropolitan State, um, Professor Bell. And I think without Professor Bell, maybe he wouldn't even be here today, but he, the way that that guy, I guess, saw through him and inspired him to continue. And the fact that he actually finished the race because he was going to give up, there was another person. Yeah. <laughs> he just did something to himself. And that, and, and just doing that itself is tiring, even with kidneys. <laughs> yep. So that, that was, yeah, that was, that was crazy. So, so when did he start that stuff? When did he start that whole uh, triathlete stuff? Before or after kidney failure? Oh, after. Crazy, right? Yeah, after, because he, he was very suicidal. And I think it's after he joined the college and um, he was asked to write something. And then he said that he wanted to be rich and have a Ferrari. But the <laughs> professor saw past that and said he had a lot to write about. And I think that's when it all started. Yeah. So, that's great. Yeah, You're really able to, to, to read between the lines, Kendall. That's good. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, yeah, Shad is a, I, I wouldn't say we're like on the friendship level, we're on the, you know, colleague level. Um, I've met him in different conferences and, uh, you know, he'll give his contact to every person he meets. You know, you can text him, call him, stuff like that. If you, if you see him in a conference or attend like even a webinar with him. He's got that foundation, the Shad Ireland Foundation. Um, he's doing a lot of good work, and he's inspiring a lot of people. And uh, the, just the the physical feat itself is inspiring. But then when you go and look at all the things that he had stacked against him, um, whether it be with his uh, his mental illness and suicidal uh, ideations or his actual physical illness and the kidney failure. Um, he still went and did something that like, I can't even imagine running a marathon mm -hmm. or half a marathon. And this guy runs a marathon and rides a hundred miles and uh, swim, swims like a couple miles, all straight shot one day. Right. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. That's insane. That's, that's uh, like that, that, that's, I mean, people die doing that stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and he went to like the world championship, right. The, the one in Kona yep. Hawaii and stuff like Hawaii, that. Yeah. He always kept his mother really close to him too. Um, I yeah. think he was also an inspiration. So, and I, and he looked like he was trying to do meet his goal before his mother passed, which yeah. you know, he did. So he 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 accomplished a lot. He really did. So so let's keep the the momentum going on that. Um, we'll we'll get into the the topic for today um, and finish up some of our our presentation. But I want you guys to keep doing that kind of background you know, find the noise in the background that it's really good noise, right? Like to find these stories, it, it, it helps to um, like build you as a, as an, as a uh, encourager, you know, as somebody that can inspire the patient. Cause like, again, like um, Anthony, I, what, what I had shared is that most of the time you don't see patients who are like, they, they have kidney failure and then their life gets better. You know, most of the time it's the opposite, right? It's it's like they have kidney failure, they they end up on dialysis, they their health starts to decline either slowly or quickly, depending on what the cause, the etiology, how they self-manage. But we don't often see patients who um, get transplant for let's for example. Let's say that's not like the everyday thing um, that go and do home dialysis. Well, that's not the everyday thing. It's it's starting to become, you know, the, a concept of an everyday thing, but it's it's not been up until now. Um, we don't see people quite often that are like finishing their their college degrees or getting their dream jobs or uh, meeting their um, their dream partner. You know, things like this. That's not like the common theme of what we see in dialysis. The common theme is more kind of on the downward trend. So I, I, I told the group to let's find stories of people who have the upward trend, you know, that that um, started running triathlons, right? That that uh, be, got their dream profession and and used like their their chronic illness as a tool to help others, right? Like like Nancy. Um, or we, we mentioned a person named Sam Trevino, um, and actually he's there in Texas, Anthony. Which part of Texas are you in? Central. 
Central Austin. Austin. Okay, so I think he's in uh, Houston. Um, but look, look this guy up, Sam Trevino. Uh, great. Trevino? Yeah, T R E V I N O. He 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 works with Fresenius now, but um, like he's got a great story. Him and his wife, they got a a, a story. Try and find the videos on him because uh, like most of these people, if you see their videos, they'll make you cry. You know, like when you when you hear their stories. If you don't cry from just reading it, <laughs> you know they're, they're pretty. Whether it's inspiring or whether it's it's heartbreaking, you know, there's there's things in there that will tug on your your heartstrings for sure. Um, so Mr. Like, going to be okay with uh, the news that you just got today? Yeah, I you know I I um, I gotta say like I I can I can process you know death. Um, it, it's that was just the first uh, word of it. The initial so, shock. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so laura um, he just found out about one of the this homework that he gave us that she passed away january 14th and he did not know about it that's what yeah. we're talking about yeah yeah so i i asked them to look up uh, a person named nancy hewitt spaith and she passed away at the beginning of this year i i didn't know that um and she's she was actually a friend so yeah no i i, I will be okay kenlin and uh, i appreciate the concern um i i, I think it's you know like kind of maybe a good segue to to just say hey guys your patience will pass right mm -hmm. and, and so will you yeah and so will you right so um like if if you're like anthony you've, sounds like you've seen this kenlin i, I know you've seen this in, mm -hmm. in the different environments joanne i'm not sure if you've seen this if you've had to deal with um patient or or customer loss and and laura i'm not i'm not sure but i'm pretty sure um coming from the acute setting that you've also seen these losses the families that you work with um you know just what what it's gonna what it's gonna take from you as a healthcare professional to to stomach it up kind of you know and and help continue to help the people that you're responsible for helping um that, that includes yourself guys Right, like yeah. the show must go on, but that also includes your teams, and then your team is only there because of the the like the the purpose for the team, the captain of the team, who's, who's those patients, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, just like I, I want you guys to think about that now, like how will I feel when when I experience this loss that that is going to happen. Um, dialysis patients the first year of dialysis somewhere around 40 percent will pass away within the first year and then the subsequent years somewhere around 20 percent will pass away so so these are not good numbers at all we're talking first year uh two out of five and and then the subsequent years one out of five will pass away yeah very tough so let let's talk about um all right so i think keeping to our theme of discussion here let's let's talk about rehabilitation today okay and it's and it's right on point with what we were just saying So let, let's explore this uh, concept of dialyzing to live. Like really explore just those three words. Like if you change them, it could be living to dialyze. And it means a whole different thing, right? Mm -hmm. so, so like take that in for yourself and go like, okay, I, I'm a healthcare professional. My my presentation matters. My my um, when I say my presentation, like the way the patient interprets uh, what I say, what I do, how I feel about my job, um, it, it matters in in this aspect of things. Because if we start to pin the patient down as kind of a, a subordinate to the to the whole process like you have to be here this time you 
have to take your medications. Don't do this, do that. And, and take that very direct like order type of approach with patients, they're going to start to feel like they're living to dialyze. I mean, they are on this schedule, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And then after dialysis, they probably feel pretty junky. So a lot of times that, that whole day is committed to dialysis and rest. Then you got the other days and then the other days, you know, the in-between days, watch your diet, take your meds, go to another doctor maybe, <laughs> right? Anthony, as a lot of your patients, they have appointments besides their dialysis treatment, right? During yeah, the week? Have, you know, uh, cardiologists, um, urology, endocrinologists, you know, all kinds of, depending on your comorbidity. Yep. Uh, uh, podiatry as well is very common for our, di our dialysis patients with the, um, you know, the ulcerations, pressure ulcerations that they'll have on their feet and things like this. Especially if you got that diabetes too, you know, it makes it even worse for you to heal up if you have right. the ulcer on your foot. Right. A double whammy. Yep. So, so again, the, I think the monotony of, of like, you have to be here at the same place, same time, same chair, same machine, take these meds, watch this diet, like this order can really make people feel as if they're living to dialyze. And, and if you lose everything else in between those days, like you lose your job or ability to work on the other days, or you, with, with your job, then you lose your ability to be any sort of breadwinner or contributor to the financials of your household, right? And, and then maybe you feel like you lost respect or maybe you lost dignity or you lost purpose. And I, I want to like talk about that a little bit. Like m m me, I love to work, guys. I love to work. And um, with work, I also love to be paid. <laughs> you know, so so I mean, I'm not going to say I don't do a lot of things um, just um, like pro bono or, or out of favor to people and things like this. But absolutely, I love to work and I love to get paid for my work. Um, and, and it makes me feel good to work and get paid and then put money in the bank and food on the table and feed my kids and give them an iPhone and, you know, buy them uh, whatever they need for their sports or whatever. I, that makes me feel good. So I, I want you to, and, and I'm very real about this. If I, if you took that away from me, I'm going to be a mental mess, a, a, a mental mess, right? Like dialyze for what now? Right. Like to me, that's 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 living like I, I'm like pretty old school, you know, like. I'm a father, I'm supposed to be doing this, you know, M more than presence, I'm supposed to be setting an example of hard work ethic and think like that's just my, my mentality. Right. So you took that away from me, dialyzing to what? Right. It's going to be this challenge. And there are answers to that. But I, I just want to point out to you that like I, I would be living to dialyze at that point for a while because i i wouldn't get it like hey my kids still need me presence is better than none right um uh, love and and contact and being there in the moments that they will have are are just as important as these moments that i feel like i need to have in working and raising money and putting food on the table right um so so it'd be but it'd be hard to get that through to me so so dialyzing to live like First of all, we got to say, like, guys, what's living to you? Right? What's living to that person? Like, what do they like to do? What makes them happy? What makes them feel purpose? Who are the people in their lives? Are there responsibilities? Are there goals? And, and th all of those things, those responsibilities, those people, um, they, they, they put something inside us called hope, right? Like w without those things, like we, we tend to lose hope. So ho hope has to be driven. And, you know, you want to be a, a, like a, an incubator to hope as, as a professional, y you want to, like know what drives your patient, honestly. Like what is it that they want to do? Who are those people? And and to me, guys, th this is me to you, okay? 
you should know the specifics. Uh, Kenlin, I can tell you're going to be very, very good with the specifics on people. Um, but remember their family names, their pastimes, you know, uh, the area that they grew up in. And, you know, all those little details make connection, right? Mm -hmm. when, when, you, when you have those details, you'll be able to connect. But also those details, they, 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 they pave the path for you to know the patients, like what drives them, their hope. Like, you, you guys know um, that, that I don't know if it's a, a meme or, or like where it came from, but like you, you put a, a, a carrot on a, like a fishing pole or on a stick on a string and you hang it in front of the rabbit, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and what does the rabbit do? It chases after the, the, the carrot, right? And, and to an extent, you got to like tie the patient's hope on a string and hold it in front of them all the time. And be like, this is what you're going for, right? When when they for, when they forget that they told you at some point that hey, you know, and I would have these conversations early, guys. Like, find out from your patients early when you first meet them, when when they first are admitted. Like, what is it that that makes you want to live? What is it that makes you pick? That makes you wake up in the morning. Um, what is it that gives you hope? You know, find your script on on that questioning, and get to know your patients. So one day when they say like, "Hey, um, you know, this is I hate this medication. I'm not going to take it anymore." You know, um, it gives me whatever side effect. Um, one like, "Hey, have we shared all this with the doctor or the person that prescribed it?" Um, but two, remember that the medical advice is there to give you the best chance at a high quality life, uh, at the longevity of life that you're looking for. And, and we, you know, we got to see, we got to see your daughter graduate, you know, chiropractic school, right? Um, like you're going to know specifically what it is that that patient is waiting, looking forward to, right? Um, what it is that is driving them and, and kind of hold it in front of them. Um, does everybody, is everybody going to be able to express that hope to you? Not at all. You're going to have a lot of patients who are not able to uh, verbalize any of this stuff. So, so I'm, you know, I'm really talking about those patients. We talk about rehab and rehabilitating patients. Um, recognize that some patients are not in that, in that condition that they're going to have much rehab. You know, the rehab for them might be, uh, uh, to be able to lift their arm again, you know, a bedridden patient, something like this, right? Whereas the rehab for a patient that is, you know, alert oriented ambulatory might be getting back to work or might be um, getting back to school or or might be to go repair the relationship with the the partner that they just uh, pissed off or something, you know, because they were they were moody about their their disease process. So so what we do is not just clean blood. I, I told you guys, it's not just about four hours, right? Mm -hmm. it, it's about the in-between as well. We help people live. So, you know, find your way of being therapeutic in those four hours beyond the needles and the machine and the dialyzer. Reinforcement of advice, encouragement, intimacy as far as knowledge of the patient, and, and again, what gives them hope. So dialyzing to live or living to dialyze, we, 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 we want our patients to dialyze to live. And when we say that, that kind of brings into question of whether, you know, everybody who's dialyzing is dialyzing to live. And if they're not dialyzing to live, why are they dialyzing? You know, um, th does that make sense? So, so like I, I, I had a patient who was uh, uh, brain dead. And we dialyzed that patient for a year in a nursing home, a subacute nursing facility for a year. There was no chance of return of brain activity. The family just couldn't come to grasp. Yeah. And, and it was like anything and everything that you can do. Oh, her heart's still beating. She's still breathing with the machine, you know. Um, but yeah, keep, keep doing it. And it, I, mean, I got to tell you, that was like pretty hard to do. Mm -hmm. Um, but when you think about all the people out there who are doing dialysis, there, there are, 
I don't want to say a lot, but there are quite a few that are like that, that perhaps would be better, perhaps I'm saying, okay, um, would be better in a, like a palliative care or a hospice type of program where the end of life would at least be a, a higher quality of life, less pain, less uh, transport, less needles and blood pressure problems and stuff like that during treatment. Um, you know, they, they get cramps and all that during treatment. So sometimes dialysis is not the most compassionate choice when we're talking about quality of life. Mm -hmm. Okay. It can definitely extend life, but it, it, it can't necessarily always improve quality of life. And, and that's what we got to say. It's like, well, why are we dialyzing? Right. It, some people, if they, if they had the choice would say, if my health is in this condition, I wouldn't want to be dialyzed. So if I couldn't make my own decisions, if I couldn't feed myself, you know, whatever the, those advanced directives are, if, if people had the choice, some people would say that, but a lot of times people don't make those decisions before it's time for them to, to be implemented. And then it comes down to family and what will family say? Like, it's no. very good. So go ahead, Kellen. Do everything. Yeah. yeah do, everything. do everything, you know, throw the whole bank at them. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, take the whole United States healthcare system. I don't care. Do whatever it takes. You know, I found that the palliative care, uh, I used to do that. Uh, first time it was very scary for me, but then I found it very comforting. Um, when mm -hmm. they do it at home, I think the family has more acceptance than when they do the, they put the person, patient on hospice in the hospital. Yeah, it's, agreed. you know, they, they feel like, hey, let, let's do this, but they, they're not understanding. So when they, when they say, hey, we're going to go ahead and put you in palliative care and just send you home to finish... I think the family is more acceptant with that, but um, you know, it, it, it's always it's always very think, difficult. You know, I think the nursing home and the long term care world is, you know, it's it's better than the hospital as well. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, because I've had a lot of patients when I was running nursing homes that um, families would actually seek out palliative care, um, or as part of our ID our interdisciplinary team meetings, we would make suggestion for palliative care make it an option um, for the patient. And, and basically, like, I, I'm going to keep the, it kind of simple. Um, you know, palliative care is there to keep people less anxiety, less pain, right? Mm -hmm. um, and, and just more comfortable overall, which, which usually equates to more medications beyond like the, the normal, um, I guess, standing orders or, or the typical medication regimens. Um, palliative care and hospice care, you'll see different types of dosing, right? To control mm -hmm. that pain and control that anxiety. And, and you might see a higher level of medications as well. Um, so, so yeah, I, I think that overall it's both palliative and hospice are very underutilized and, and really beautiful le levels of care. Um, but a, a reason why they're underutilized is that trust factor that you talked about um, and just or the acceptance of like sometimes people feel as if that's giving up and that's hard for families to do. Right. And then, and then on the other side, sometimes people feel, and, and there can be a level of, I guess there's a reason for this, this perception, but um, that palliative or hospice care will kill their family. Um, just do it faster. Um, yeah. So, so there, there are, I think some, some myths that have some truth to them. If, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, and, and there's been a controversial, controversial industry in the palliative care and hospice industry as well, as with all healthcare, there's good people and bad people, right? Mm -hmm. and, and when you get people that are bad people on the side of such a sensitive level of care of like end of life, um, there's just going to be a lot of, uh, a lot of bad, bad static in the air. Yeah. So we help people to live, like, think about that. All right. Like be, before you say, like, I save lives, say I help people to live mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because and, and you'll see that a lot. A lot of your colleagues out there are going to say, we, you know, I save lives. And, and it's true to an extent. But typically these outpatient dialysis centers, that's not what we're doing. We're, we're helping people to live more than we're saving lives. That dialysis is life sustaining. Right. It's not like meant for like, hey, they're dying. Save them. It's yeah. meant to keep them alive, extend life 
um, it, it's it's you know to help them stay afloat and and not drowned in all the complication of renal failure, right? Mm -hmm. So when we say we help people live, remember it, living is not just breathing and your heart beating. Anthony, what what what's your like sum it up in in a couple sentences? What makes what what's your reason for living? What's my reason, like my personal reason? Yeah. Just to have a better future for myself and for the people around me. To not see anybody that I'm close to struggle. Mm -hmm. All right. That's noble. How about you, Joanne? For me, um, to give my daughter a good life. All right. Mm -hmm. You have one daughter. Yeah, only one. Lucky. <laughs> Maybe you want more. But, uh, watch out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it gets hard. <laughs> mm -hmm. How about you, Laura? Good morning. To have a quality life with my children. I have a three-year-old and a seven-year-old. Um, and to be able to uh, provide for them and be part of their lives for as long as I can. I mean, we never know when we're going to die. And, you know, it's just um, that's very important to try to spend every minute that I can with them and in their activities and that stuff. So they know that I'm present, you know? All right. How about you, Kenley? Oh, mine's real simple. <laughs> I I'm living to ride. Um, I, uh, I'm a workaholic and I have done, I've been working since I was 15 and six days a week, seven days a week. I single mom of two kids. Um, they're grown now and I've just always been there for everybody else except myself. And now it's time for me and okay. uh, new That's change really career. Cool. And now I just, you know, my spare time, I just get on a bike and I just ride away. <laughs> There you go. That's nice. That's nice. But yeah, I'm, I'm that's how I'm living my life now. It's just like I'm enjoying it. I got a new change in career now, and so it's going to be a whole good year for me. That's great. So, so I mean, let, let's think about like let's spoil the party, okay? And and you got you got kidney failure, and what does that what does that do? Does it change any of those things that you guys talked about? You know, um, Kenlin, it sounds like. Same, same, you know, kidney failure, live to live to ride. <laughs> yeah, I, it, it can it can be a challenge because then there comes a depression. But if, if you if you have a good support group or good friends or family that support you, you you it's it's you can you can still accomplish what you have. But I just think when people are through that, a support group is so important. Yeah. So yeah. there's a so there's a if then there's a if. Yes. If, if. if I have the support group, if I have my friends, if I have you know, somebody to, to crutch me. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Then I can, I can probably make it through all those, that emotional ride that you're going to be on, right? You're going to be on another ride with you got kidney failure, right? Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and then Laura, you mentioned like just the time investment in your children. Like what, what does that do if you have kidney failure? Like how, how does that change any of that? Oh, it limits the time for sure. Because now you have to, you know, like we talked about the three days a week going to dialysis and going to sleep. So then three days a week, you're away from them. And the other three to four days a week, you're, you know, other medical appointments and it limits the time you have with them. And it limits the quality because if you don't have energy to go playing around with three-year-olds, <laughs> how are you going to be part so of what, it? What's some of your suggestions or what's some of the answers to that, that whole equation? Cause you mentioned the three days a week in the center. Like, what are some workarounds? Well, since, we, since we help people to live, what would you say to somebody like a patient that's in your situation with the two children and, you know, the, the desire to be with them as much as possible in, in their, their adolescence and, and their life? Like, what would you say? I would say, you know, let's look at the scheduling for the dialysis, because if you're really tired after dialysis, maybe we can try to do, like we talked about, the last shift, mm -hmm. where they, and that way they sleep. And then they have more energy in the morning so they can spend 
more energetic days with them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you can look at scheduling for them. What else? Like I, I, I want be, besides that center right there, what else could, what else resources. could you do? Resources for them. And uh, we've talked about several resources. You, you've, you, Mr. Morales, have told us about all these different resources out there, and the the people, um, the support network from Ms. Lori Hartwell, and those types of things. Are, uh, maybe pointing them out into, you know, I don't know if they have pamphlets or things like that. The Dialysis Center that you can share with them, so they can talk to them about these stories and say. Anybody you know, has a suggestion for Laura on how to spend more time with her kids? You can do home hemo. That's what I'm looking for. Oh, that's right. Home hemo. <laughs> there you go. That's what we're looking for. You can stay home and do it at home, right? Do it yourself or have your partner or your friend or, um, you know, maybe when your kid gets old enough, you know, well, that's another probably eight years at least or so. <laughs> um, you said seven, the oldest one, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you could, you could do it at home and then um, there wouldn't be that time sacrifice, right? There would just be this, this learning curve of like, hey, um, they're both girls, right, Laura? No, one and one. Okay, so hey, kids, uh, you know we got this new piece of equipment or this new furniture in our house, right? <laughs> Mom's gonna be sitting on it, you know, every Monday, whatever. You know, this this sort of schedule. We're gonna watch some TV. You guys are gonna have to do your homework and be good during the time because uh, I'm gonna have to sit down for a couple hours, right? Like, so you'd have to teach them all about this whole process and. Um, it's not, it's not a big deal. Like I grew up with it. My cousin grew up with it. Like we thought everybody had a dialysis machine in their house. It, it was news to us when we figured out like, oh, that's not a part of, that's not actually a piece of furniture in everybody's house. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, so, you know, this, this, this attitude, right? Um, you, you got to have this attitude of optimism, of hope, of positive, of encouragement, um, and, and to an extent, like you're going to know your patients, but when you find out like, Hey, you know, what's your favorite, you know, your favorite, your favorite hobby. Well, I like to go to the gardening club, you know, every Tuesday and Thursday. Um, not only do I get to grow some vegetables, but I get to meet some, some, uh, available ladies, right. You know, <laughs> uh, like th that's what seniors do, right. They, you, you'll see when they're interacting, they're like, I'm going to go meet some ladies or I'm going to go meet the, the gentleman, you know, at the senior club, stuff like this. Right. So, OK, you like to go do the gardening. Right. Um, and and now I know that about you. Right. Kellen, you like to garden. I know this. OK, mm -hmm. so, so I'm going to tap in on that every now and then. Right. And they'd be like, how's the gardening going, Kellen? And, and and then it's like, well, I stopped doing that. <laughs> Well, you really love to do it. Like you, you, you had mentioned how much that was your favorite thing to do, and you went every Tuesday. What, what happened? You know. And then I let you tell me, and you're like, "Well, I just don't feel good about myself anymore. Um, you know, the way I look, or the, um, you know, maybe I don't feel as good." So, so when, when you when you find out what their normal is, and you kind of tap in and check on that and hold them accountable to it, right? You, you can find you can find sometimes the loss of ability or sometimes just the loss of the interest or the loss of the the reward or the fulfillment they get out of things which can lead that, that can talk more to the mental side of it so ability we definitely want to know what the patients you know as they're losing abilities to do things in life right we want to keep a gauge on that um but we also want to keep a gauge on that that general well-being like are are they letting this thing kick their butt? You know, and, and when I say are they letting it, Ken, then you you said, you know, if I had the support network, we can't just put it all on the patient, like, oh, they're letting it whoop their yeah. ass. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's too hard to deal with alone, right? If you guys look up Lori Hartwell, that's one of her her key taglines is chronic illness is too difficult or too hard to deal with alone. Mm -hmm. That's why they made the renal support network. So Lori Hartwell is a, a lady who started a support network here in California, Anthony, but I also mentioned to check her out, um, L-O-R-I-H-A-R-T-W-E-L-L. -L. Um, she had kidney failure when she was two years old. Um, and, um, God, and that was crazy news today. I almost 
uh, oh god like a horrible feeling um but yeah laurie's been I, she's about my age probably maybe mid to late 40s um maybe a little older and uh I had kidney failure since two years old like four transplants like nancy been through all the modalities and 40 surgeries and won all kinds of awards and, and very accomplished person but um, yeah, she says that chronic illness is too difficult to deal with alone. And, and um, you know, when you expect people to keep doing what they love, like, <laughs> you don't know, man. Like, how, how, do you, how can you say that you can keep doing it, right? That's what might come. Like, you don't know what it's like to have kidney failure, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and that's probably, I hope that's true for all of us. I hope we never find out what it's like. But that's why I said, go steal people's stories. Be able to point real people out. You know, the people I mentioned to you, they got websites and stuff, right? They got YouTube channels and like, you can go find these people and, and listen to their story and you can point them out to your patients as well and be like, hey, I, I'm telling you, you can do it because I've seen people do it. You know, here's an example. You know, Mr. Morales, I went to some... I went to some support groups and I know they said that there's two words that we're supposed to not say. And I don't know if this applies to everyone, but to when a patient is going through stuff, when you say, I understand, it tends to make them a little angry if they're just beginning, because how would you understand? You're not, you don't have yeah. the cancer. And another one is it'll be okay. Yep. So, those are the two things that we stay away from saying because like when when i go through and, I, and i've experienced that when i've gone through some losses in the family and somebody says it'll be okay i'm like well how do you know it's going to be okay yeah you know, it's one of those safe words that are not realistic when someone's going through something so i just thought that was pretty interesting no i think those that that's that's helpful um yeah. to to say that you know one like adversity can't be understood without experiencing adversity right yeah. um and then when you say it's going to be okay, it's it's there's a couple of ways to see that. It's like, well, one, how would you how would you know? But but two, like you're not acknowledging what I'm going through right now either. Um, you know, right now this is difficult for me, right? Right now um, this is the hardest thing I've ever dealt with in my life. Right now I feel like the world is you know crumbling all around me because I lost my job and. And my wife is leaving me because I lost my job and I can't pay for the house anymore. And you know, my kids don't look at me the same way anymore. You know, so so um, I, I think that's good advice, Kelly. Yeah, absolutely. So these success stories, again, they're examples for you guys. They're they look them up, find people, okay? It's gonna be beneficial to your patients for you to be able to point out real examples of of triumph, of success. Um, you know, the um the fairy tales if you will um because uh, again you don't see it quite often i'm excited that we're starting to see more patients become advocates and champions and tell their stories of success and hope um maybe it was in the past that those stories were always there and we just didn't hear about them and things like social media and, and the internet are helping us um but I'm also excited to think that with new technologies that we are going to see more success stories of people who do dialysis at home and and use like innovative technologies to make life easier and and I, I would I would dare to say you know uh, somewhat normal again uh, for them. So so we want to encourage the patients to find answers just like I'm encouraging you to find stories. We want them to find answers about their specific disease about. Um, different types of, of dialysis, about uh, clinics, uh, about uh, champions, success stories like we talked about. So, it, you know, hey, Mr. Morales, you know, there's this thing called Google, right? <laughs> like, feel free to use it. It's, it's, it's free if you got internet um, and you can, you can look up basically anything, right? If you got diabetes, you can find forums and websites and, and CDC information on diabetes. If you've got polycystic mm -hmm. kidney disease or if you've got you know if you have i bet you if you said esrd patient animal lovers i bet you you find a group mm -hmm. you know what i mean so it's kind of like hey that's that's the way the world is now you could find people like 
that, that, are, that are going through the same things as you that have even sometimes going through the same thing and the same interest, like they got kidney failure and they love dogs, right? <laughs> or, or they're, they're uh, boarding, what you do animal boarding. Right? <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. Like it's a new way to uh, stay employed while you have, even though you have kidney failure, right? <laughs> uh, animal boarding, uh, you teach that class, Kenlin. <laughs> That's right. Uh, um, so yeah, like celebrate with them, like help them, encourage them, um, help them. And, and I think by knowing the resources yourself, like that's how you point them to them, right? So, hey, here's a website, check it out. Then they come back and they, like I asked you guys to do, and they got the whole story and be like, man, that is so great. Like, uh, you know, thank them for, for looking it up. Like it's a favor to you, but then be excited that they found out information that's going to help themselves. Um, there, there's a, a website that we'll talk about, um, but I, I just want to kind of make an example of this right now. If if you were a dialysis, if you needed dialysis, and then you were seeing a doctor in the hospital or a doctor in a doctor's office, and they just said, "Hey, you're going to need dialysis starting next Monday. You know, we're going to get a catheter in your neck on Friday, um, and then Monday, you know, just go to this clinic." Would that be okay for you? That that you comfortable with that? Just go to this clinic? No. Or do, or do you want to go like, well, which clinic? Um, how do they compare to others? Like, what's their what's their Yelp rating? <laughs> more more information, yeah. Yeah, I you want all that. Stuff. I need more, you know, yeah. told to me. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So you, so you'd want to know more about that clinic, like you know, um, operating hours, operating days, type of therapies, what their outcomes look like. Um, you know, you, you'd want to know it all as much as you could get, right? So there's a website called Dialysis Facility Compare. And, and there's a similar website for nursing homes too, Nursing Home Compare, but it's a Medicare website, Dialysis Facility Compare. And like anybody could go to that website and just type in their zip code and then boom, like you'll get all the clinics around your area and you can see all their star ratings, not Yelp, uh, Medicare star ratings. And then like all their performance metrics their hours of operation, their doctors, the type of therapies they offer. You can see it all. And then like, what if the one the doctor told you to go to, like it was, it was, let's say it was Laura, right? And and we all decided for Laura that she's going to do home dialysis, right? So no choice, Laura, you're doing home dialysis. <laughs> um, but the, 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 the center that you would, uh, that the doctor told you to go to, they don't have home dialysis training. All they offer is in-center dialysis. Knowing that, you know, Laura, best best for her and her choice would be home, um, would that dialysis center be the ideal place to start or, or would it be better for her to start in a place that can do the in-center dialysis but also offers the home training? Two in one, for oh, sure. Yeah. yeah, the two in one, right? So, so do you think patients know about this website i just told you <laughs> no nurses don't Probably either. <laughs> yeah <laughs> i didn't even know that existed and i'm a tech yeah, yeah. so, so like, you, that's why i say is you know these things you can empower patients right that they're not meant for 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 us guys like this information is not meant for us per se we we are just like vessels facilitating them. sorry that sorry say it again facilitating this information to the patients but yeah. I question for you, Mr. Morales, they're able to choose because this is news to me. When we're oh, discharging, yeah. we, we get the discharge planner involved and they choose. <laughs> no, they are absolutely um, able to choose. And uh, a discharge planner cannot dictate choice. OK, so although they do, a uh, discharge planner and the case management group will like somebody's discharging. Hey, we need a dialysis center. Find one. Right. The patient could go like, well, do they have home dialysis? But do the patients do that? No. It's Normally, it's just, know. yeah, they don't know. Okay? They're just like, um, you know, it's too much at once, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so I mean, we're, we're getting better about this. And case management and discharge, they're starting to see more and more right out of the hospital to home, like straight to home mm -hmm. uh, or straight to home training. But but for years, it was just like if anybody came out of the hospital, they're going in center for sure. So, yes, yeah, I know. Able to choose. I, know um, I know recently satellite 
before they got brought over by CVS, you used to have social workers go into the hospital yeah. in the acute setting and try yeah. to persuade them to go to home hemo. I'll tell them, you know, we have this option. You don't have to go straight to from in hospitals in the center. You can go home and do this, you know, with the yeah. different modalities. Not not just to get go home, but also even to just get them into the, the organization itself. So like they like everybody did it. Davida, Fresenius, Satellite, they put case managers. And then they had to change the the name of those people that I forgot what they call them now, but um, case managers in the hospital that were basically like evangelists for their organization or the, a modality within their organization, like home hemodialysis. Um, so the, 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 the treatment therapy, the location, the patient can choose. Um, and, and if the discharge planner said, Hey, you're going here, the patient could say that's too far or, the patient could say they don't have home dialysis or oftentimes it's this is where they're going to go until they find a center that is more appropriate. So sometimes patients end up in a center that is far away from home and there's one there's like two or three clinics that are closer to them. Does that make sense? So there's a lot of factors to that discharge plan. It's not just like what the patient wants, where they want to go, but also, um, you know, what's the availability of the facility? What's their chair availability? And then, and then on the patient side, if they have any sort of uh, bloodborne pathogens or infectious status, that can, you know, be another variable to it. Or if they have a, 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 a trach vent or or anything like this, then yeah, it'll be much more challenging to place them. The comorbidities. <clears throat> so, so we we also aside from you know encouraging the financiers and things like this. Um, on the internet or to to just do more research on their own and find these stories, these success stories. We want uh, to encourage and empower our patients to take action and actually take part in the treatment. And, and that's like a, a, a transition type of approach where if they can do stuff in the center, then they could do it at home too, right? So if we start to teach them to do things in the center and, and patients can have self-care in center, you're going to see more and more of that now, uh, Anthony. Uh, that's going to be a real sign of the times because of the way reimbursement is going. The clinic can get more reimbursement for doing self-care in center. Um, so you're going to see clinics start to do that more. So, so some yeah, I, actually, at the one I'm at right now, I already there's already a patient there that's been sticking the cells every time I've been, and that's yeah. been like over a year now. That's good. That's good. I mean, it provides a lot of dignity. It's helpful, you know. Um, it, the patients definitely, um, I'd say, it kind of puts them at ease when they're taking part in their in their treatment. Just you know, a, a certain level of control. But we want them to understand their treatments. It's important to them, right? Everything about the treatment is important to them, and everything in between the treatments important to them. So, uh, all the knowledge in our heads is is really only good for four hours while the patient's there. But if we are able to transfer our knowledge to the patient, then it can be lasting and, and help them to live, right, in between dialysis. Um, we want them to take that active role. So, um, you know, slowly but surely having them do things in the treatment, it might be to clean their access. Um, they all should be washing their access arm before the treatment with soap and water anyways, but maybe even prep it before we put the needles or like Anthony said, maybe put the needles or maybe do the calculations for how much fluid or or um, maybe do do it all. Um, like I said, self-care in center. Yeah, this patient, you know, pretty much does it all. I mean, she comes in, she has the scale. By the time she's walking from the scale to her chair, she's calculating her dry weight and what yeah. her free weight is and subtracting what her fluid outtake would be today, you know, what her goals are going to be. And then she, you know, she washes her arm and then she does a whole shebang, cleans her access, you know, with the proper amount of time, you know, with alcohol, you know, you know all this, every uh, technique possible. She does it all. That's good. Yeah. So, I mean, next for her should be that if it hasn't happened already, should be that conversation of, you know, what's the home environment like and whether she might want to take it into and her own hands. It. I think that's what's stopping her is her home environment, you know. So, for example, if she had her own, if she owned her own house, you know, and all that, she can 
get it going, but it's not technically her place. So she's know, like she in a multi-family it. household or something like that. Exactly. You yeah. know, she, she does with her daughter. It, you know, it's a whole thing. Too many kids running around, dogs and cats. You know, and you know I want to I want to point that out. Like that, I'm glad you said that because when we look at the disparity in America, um, and we say like urban disparity, especially right. Um, we'll say that African American and Hispanics, right, are the highest incidence of CKD, ESRD in the United States, type two diabetes, hypertension as well. And and when you look at the households in urban areas, they're quite often multifamily households. And when you got a multifamily household, um, you you quite often have varying working schedules, um, limitations in space, um, uh, sometimes a lack of respect for space things like that. So it can make home dialysis very difficult, um, sometimes in the, the tightest knit families, right? Because we know that African-American Hispanic families are very tight knit. Um, but but at the same time, the, the complexity of a multifamily household can be a, a limiting factor. It's like all this help, right? <laughs> you got all these people to help, but <laughs> just not enough space to do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then you know on that disparity side of things as well um i i can never i can never like get past that those multifamily households it can be pretty hard to sleep too um yeah. you know to, to get a moment's rest and then sleep is a, actually a a contributing factor to type 2 diabetes and hypertension like lack of sleep mm -hmm. so, so when we talk about urban disparity and the whole lifestyle issue um, it, it's, it, it's, it's quite a driver, um, on social, on several levels. So keeping fit, we, we do want our patients to, um, have physical activity, right? Like kidney failure doesn't mean you can't, you can't take care of yourself and get your, get your cardio up and, you know, take weight, uh, take walks and lift weights and all that kind of, like people can still do that stuff. There might be some physician oversight on certain things and maybe some um, special instructions for like the access extremity, like where they have their graft or fistula, maybe to not um, carry heavy objects with that or you know to limit it to a certain weight um, with a catheter to not go swimming like this guy is, right? Um, because you can't get a catheter, a catheter wet. Yeah. Um, so there might be some special instructions, but you guys saw it, Chad Ireland, right? He's he went and did a marathon. And mm -hmm. Sam Trevino was a collegiate soccer player. Um, you know, I know uh, there's a guy they call him Kidney Fighter. Um, I don't actually know his name. I just I have him on social media, but he's like an outstanding boxer, man. Uh, outstanding, big big old fistula in his arm. You know, mm -hmm. um, like a coach and like a, a kind of like a motivational type of person does a lot of those motivational videos and stuff. Um, so yeah, there's there's people out there still doing some extreme stuff, but it doesn't have to be extreme, right? Like mm -hmm. um, taking go for a, a walk around your neighborhood. Yeah, yeah go for a walk, ride a bike, um, swim or or waiting, um, or the, like the classes at you know the gym of swimming where it's like got the little, uh, the foam resistance things that you'll wave around in the water and just get range of motion and it's still muscle stimulation, right? Um, and mm -hmm. have cardio, uh, cardio value to it. Um, so, so it's it's really important for all of us. It's really important for our patients, um, and we want them to kind of continue what they were doing, with the exception of anything that the doctor would limit, like maybe swimming with a catheter or or carrying a heavy object with a with a fish hook. Um, and and keeping fit is not always a um, it, it's not always a, like a purposeful exercise, right? It could be, um, that I like to dance and, you know, now I can't dance. I, I get tired after, you know, a minute of dancing where I used to be able to dance all night. Right. Um, mm -hmm. it could, it could be sexual intercourse. You know, I, I, I used to be able to have long sessions of sexual intercourse and now, you know, it, I can't even start. Um, uh, so that's, a, that's a indicator of physical fitness, right? Um, especially in males, um, sexual intercourse. So, so the keeping fit 
um, is important from several aspects, from cardiovascular um, to um, sexual uh, wellness and, you know, the effects that that might have on relationships. Think about that, guys. Like, let, let, I had a patient, like, he's 23, I think, um, when he came, started coming to dialysis, and him and his girlfriend, they had a little baby. Um, it was already walking, so I guess, like, that's toddler or something, right? Um, so they had a, a, a young child. They're both look like a beach body, you know, like uh, Abercrombie and Fitch, the, the, the guy and his girlfriend, they're like tanned and muscular and thin and, you know, like perfect, like look like a magazine. And mm -hmm. uh, he started coming to dialysis. And after about three months, his, um, he declined physically. He ended up with a catheter. He got a couple infections. He lost a bunch of weight. He, he just looked different. And I saw him one day. And uh, he he wasn't with his girlfriend. And I kind of asked, you know, where's the family? And he's like, oh, she left me. Mm. And I was like, what? And he was like, you know, look at me, you know, like I've changed so much. And he said, I, I can't even get it up. That's what he told me. You know, young man, um, very being very on the level with me, right? And uh, I, I, I mean, it broke my heart to hear that you know, the, the girl left. I, I don't think that's really why she left because of that. Um, maybe because of the whole thing, like, you know, I'm 23 and I don't know if I could deal with this whole, yeah. this whole thing. Right. I, I, I can't hate on her immediately. I did hate on her. I was like, Oh my God, you know, <laughs> like I thought she was such a bad person, but it took me about 30 seconds to go like, who am I to judge? And man, this is a big, it's a big, uh, a, a big piece of meat on the plate to digest, right? The, the, the person that you want to spend the rest of your life with or that you're thinking about it um, is going to have kidney failure, perhaps have a, a shortened life, a very difficult life, no matter what, right? There's going to be a lot of discipline involved on both his and her part if she's stuck around. Um, so again, I think this is a, a really important part of, of wellness, physical fitness, um, there's, there's a lot of benefit aside from the cardiovascular, aside from the aesthetics of things, just your, your emotion, right? You, 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 you got some good, some good chemicals going when you exercise, uh, endorphins, for example. So staying happy, staying clear minded, um, exercise will benefit a lot there. Any, any, anything to say about fitness guys? I have a question, Mr. Morales, just because mm -hmm. I come from the inpatient setting and all my patients tend to be on the geriatric scale, very few younger ones. Why would a 23 year old go into dialysis? That was a kidney failure due to like, was it drug abuse or like, um, what do you call them? So, uh, so it could be a number of things. There could be um, like, protein, the stuff. like autosomal dominant type of things um, or, or hereditaries, um, Wagner's disease, uh, uh, polycystic kidney disease, Alport syndrome, like there's all these, these kind of lower, lower market value, I guess you would say, like they don't have many patients that have this stuff, but there are things like that. Then there's type one diabetes, there's type two diabetes, which is typically not our 20 year old, but, um, uh, glomerular nephritis, um, acute kidney injury of any sort, you know, whether it be from, uh, hypovolemia, blood loss, or, like you said, drugs maybe. Um, and man, if you went to the gym today, I, I guess that a good one out of 10 people in the gym are doing steroids um, and that could knock your kidneys out at an early age. Um, so, so you know, there's a number of things, Laura. Um, uh, I, I, I did a, a convention years ago for nephrologists, like an international convention that they, they brought about 40 nephrologists to Las Vegas from around the world. And they invited me to speak on a topic as well. But one of the nephrologists, his presentation was bites, stings, and venoms um, and pediatric AKI, pediatric acute kidney injury. So like I thought it was when I saw the title, I was like, what? You know, bites, stings, and venoms. He was from India. And the number one cause of uh, pediatric kidney failure in, in like his province or domain or whatever you call it um, was... Uh, uh, bites, stings, and venoms, <laughs> that like snakes and scorpions and spiders and stuff like this, right? And and I was like, well, that's crazy, right? But you think about it, like 
yeah, maybe kids play with stuff like that. I remember when I was a kid, I'll grab a black widow or, you know, any lizard or anything. I'll pick it up, right? Put it mm -hmm. in the junk and w watch it for a few days until it made a, a web around itself or, you know, <laughs> till it died or whatever, right? Uh, uh, and and uh, w that's what kids do. They, they're curious. So in that part of India, kids play with vipers and scorpions and stuff. They get stung, they get bit, whatever. And the the venoms have nephrotoxic agents in them, uh, things like uh, sting stingray and uh, blowfish and what do they call those ones that float around jellyfish. Jellyfish, yeah. <laughs> those kind Neuro of things. Right? Yeah, neurotoxins. <clears throat> wow. Yeah, so they have neurotoxins, nephrotoxins, all these different animals, and even snakes. Some of them have nephro neurotoxins. So just depends on the animal, but but. You say, why would a young person have kidney failure? There's plenty of young people who have kidney failure out there. It's not typically your lifestyle, <laughs> the type 2 diabetic hypertensive at that early age. Um, not to say that it couldn't be, though. Thank you for the teaching opportunity, Mr. Morales. No problem. And and this is a... Sorry, Kenlin, go ahead. Oh yeah, with with Laura's question, the the three the assignments that you gave us, they all had it at a young age, um, right? Laura had it when she was two years old. Laurie had it when she was two, and I cannot remember the cause of her kidney failure for the life of me. Yeah, um, I, didn't, I didn't. I was looking for that. I didn't. I didn't see that anywhere. Um, I know Chad, Chad had it when he was eighteen. I feel like it was something weird, Lori. Um, because Shad, 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 I, Shad, I think, had uh, glomerular nephritis, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. And so did Sam. He had glomerular nephritis. So that 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 can happen with young people quite often. Um, lup oh, lupus as well, Laura. Lupus. lupus young, young, right. young ladies' disease, right? I mean, it's not only young ladies, but primarily younger younger females that, that is the onset of lupus. And yeah, systemic lupus erythematosus. That could be a young onset as well. If I'm not mistaken, that's what uh, Selena has, right? So, Selena so, Gomez. Oh, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't watch TV. <laughs> is is Anthony, that what what her cause was was lupus? Oh. For Selena Gomez, yeah. Yeah, and same with um, uh, Mariah Carey's husband uh, or ex-husband. Uh, Nick Cannon, Nick Cannon, yeah. Oh yeah, he has lupus too? Yep. Okay. So so this one like speaks really like close to my heart, near and dear, um, mm -hmm. keeping a job. Like I, 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 you know, I've made my life out of, like I work hard, but I can honestly say I've, I've made my life out of helping people get jobs too. Um, you know, 20, 20, 22 years now of in this industry, but every single year i've i've been a part of educating and helping people to transition into the vocation so so like employment's really something that i uh i hold a high a high value on you know um it's kind of like oxygen <laughs> like, you know i had i had a real quick question about that mr morales with what anthony was talking about with one of his patients i thought about that for a while after we got off the class the the one that um was some kind of IRS officer that could not complete his dialysis because he, yeah. had, he had work. Yep. Um, I, I don't know how it would be, but wouldn't that be something which would be, no, not discriminative, but um, it's something they have to do. Your job really has to work around you because this is basically your health and, and you have to have this stuff. Like he said that he would cut his stuff short because he'd go into dialysis. I mean, how long ago was that? Or is that something recent that happened? Like, I, I, is that recent, Anthony? Uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure for, um, you know, cause I'm, a, I'm a traveler, so I didn't, I didn't know him very well like that. Oh, I, okay. know, I just okay. knew he always cut his treatment, you know, by 30 minutes just to get to work. And I'd be yeah. like, you know, you have to sign your AMA, you know, I, you should stay, you know, I'd always try to convince him to say, he said, no, I got to go, I got to go work. You know, he, he would just, in one ear, the other, and just say. So he did it at what time? He he went early and then went to work yeah. after? Yeah, he, you know, five, 5.15 put on time, you know, 
get um, up and walk. That's incredible that he could that he could even do that. Wow. Because it's uh tire so tiring, you know, he go to work after dialysis. That, after dialysis, straight after like he already, yeah, you know, that's not the dressed, norm at all. Yeah, getting dressed in our bathroom and then heading straight to work. Oh wow. Yeah. Now now to answer your question, there are ADA laws, the American with disability laws. Uh, that's American what with disability Act. There are laws, but um but it's tough to enforce. I mean, even for like when I was trying to breastfeed, I couldn't get my you either eat or you pump. But you can't do both. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it, and that's, that's what exactly it is. Like, uh, it's hard to actually make the full accommodation for those times, you know. And mm -hmm. um, to an extent, it's like if you if the person if the accommodations cannot still allow the person to do their job, then the employment will not last. Yeah, that's sad. It's yeah. sad. But, but I would say too, like other things like that now. I don't know if I don't know how long ago, the, ago that was, but FMLA allows you to like intermittent FMLA or things like that. Yeah. Yeah. But uh with, with that patient, Anthony's patient, like I, I feel like the 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 solution there was for the clinic to move his time, um, or to yeah. attempt to move his time to an earlier time if it could because he came on at five, you said. So maybe he could have yeah, come on. So maybe um, it, been the first patient on or something, you know. Well, the thing is, there, like, from what I understand, there were, you know, offers to move him up to the first patient on, you know. But he always declined, said this would be the best time for me. I think he lived in another city, too. He came from um, Colleen, <laughs> which is like an hour and a half away, which made oh, no wow. sense why, with why he would always come over here. But he said, my job is right down the right down the street. Oh, uh, okay. Gotcha. So, so he basically, okay. you know, it, it was ideal for him. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a lot of stuff going on. Okay. Yeah. That, that sounds like they tried to make the accommodation. So that's what that's yeah. what should be done is the clinic, you know, and, and I'm glad you asked that question because like you'll have a patient one day that's like half hour late all the time, right? Every time half hour late. And if you don't ever ask them why, then like shame on you. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> She'd be like, you know, why are you late? Like just be straight up. Like what 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 makes you late every time or what made you late today? Uh, I have to take my daughter to school, you know, um, we, we live in Compton, right? I, I can't let her walk to school because dangerous, right? So I'm going to, I, I got to drive her to school, make sure she gets in her class. And then I come to dialysis afterwards. And and then at that point you go like, oh, well, um, inside your head, you know, like what is, is mom going to change? No, mom's going to make sure the kid gets to school. So mm -hmm. who needs to change the dialysis center, right? Exactly. <laughs> they change mom's mom's time so that she can be you know get her full her full treatment time but keeping a job is important um keeping a job is important which one's easier keep a job get a job keeping keeping a job yeah keeping a job absolutely so that that's the problem like how fast can somebody adjust when they have kidney failure how, how fast can all the accommodations be made from scheduling um, and then getting used to how you're going to feel after treatment and, and getting used to drive time and all that kind of stuff, right? That you, you, whatever you have to do is to accommodate getting to work and doing your job. Um, it, it can be tough. And, and sometimes you, you can't really blame an employer that sometimes they can't wait that long. You know, it's like, hey, three months we've been going through this, right? And, and, and you've been at work one day a week that whole time, right? You're not full time anymore, right? It's just it's just not happening. So unfortunately, life kind of gets ahead of people. And and I think easily you can see people that would fall into the the thought of like, hey, there has to be accommodation for me. I have this illness, but on the side of business, like you you think about it. What could you do? If you if you need somebody five days a week from this time to this time, and they can only be there one day a week or two days a week and and at a different time than what you need them, are you going to keep them employed? Mm. No. I, I, you know, it's tough, right? Like you want to say yes, because like I want to, I want to help my employees. I want to be that that boss that will take care of my employees first. But there, there's only an employee if there's a business, right? <laughs> yeah. And and business has to keep going. So yeah, it's it, keeping a job is important having enough empowerment through education and resources early on and then understanding those resources early on gives the patient the best shot. Um, matter of fact, 
education before you have kidney failure and knowledge of home dialysis and access and like all the things you're going to have to go through it really pays dividends as far as like a return on investment when a person ends up with kidney failure having been able to plan ahead mm. having been able to kind of digest the thoughts of kidney failure what would be the best fit for me in the center at home peritoneal all those things right and man some people when they find out they have kidney failure can rally up fast enough and go like hey to all my five million fans selena gomez right or whatever number of fans she's got um i'm sure it's more than five million um but but to all my fans like hey i need a kidney get in line right <laughs> and 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 we can all do that right we can all not maybe five million fans but you know the five people in our family the 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 office we work in like hey i have kidney failure like people hold up signs for their their spouses and stuff like that these days people put up facebook ads um and and you never know you could get a transplant right a preemptive transplant like a transplant before you need dialysis would prevent the the whole tsunami of change some people do get that and then we want patients to continue to 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 dream you know not not just dream but live out dreams that is a dialysis patient um doing tandem skydiving um not everybody's going to go skydiving guys but you know they, they want to go you know see israel they want to go visit their homeland again they want to um you know earn a bachelor's degree is the dialysis patient the um the one on the bottom yeah the bottom is that the, is that the fistula on, on the right forearm yep yep that's you amazing clearly make it out right yep all right guys so ah. we're, we're gonna end there and um we are kind of like we're in a weird place because uh we, we've talked about some stuff in module two already, and then we still have some stuff in module one to talk about. So Monday, I'm gonna continue on module one, but I do want you guys to, uh, sorry, Tuesday. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna keep doing Tuesday. this. Uh, Tuesday, we will uh, continue to work through module one on um, some professionalism. And then I wanna talk about payment and quality with you guys, like the the way that we get paid in dialysis and, and how quality is uh, overseen. Um, from like Medicare and and different entities, um, and then as uh, on Thursday and Saturday we'll get into module two, and we'll be in module two for a few weeks. It's a big module with a lot of topics. Okay, um, so any questions for now, folks? I have a question, Mr. Morales. Shoot. With with the whole push to home home um, dialysis, hemodialysis, and how it'll benefit the patient, and it'll definitely cost the cost and all those things. Do you see that nursing and hemodialysis is still important? Because it seems like if you're teaching them, you're not going to be dialysis, dialyzing them anymore. I mean, do you think well, you're not? You're not, but it's, it's, yes, yes. It really allows for um. So okay, it's a good question, mm -hmm. and and techs might feel the same way as well. Like, oh, if they go home, do we have a job anymore? Right. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, not everybody's going to go home. First of all. Uh, a good chunk of our patients um, would never be able to do home dialysis because they're not of age. They don't have the the home environment. They don't have the support network. Um, when I say not of age, like they're, um, I shouldn't have said it that way. They're not of like alert and oriented, um, self responsible status, right? They're in that that status <laughs> where they need care. Um, but but when when we train them, then a nurse has to be kind of like a case manager. So there's a dialysis training nurse that will become um, their dialysis nurse. And and where we're seeing that evolve to now, it used to be like the patient dialyzes, they write on their paper charts and they call the nurse when they need to, right? Like a 24 hour nurse. Now it is, um, there's electronic medical record, uh, recording. So they, they use apps to do different documentation from their treatment, those apps can, pick up the parameters from the treatment. So like literally Anthony could be dialyzing right now. The nurse could be watching a monitor of like five or six patients of what's going on with their treatment, pressures and 
uh, on the machine and blood pressures and stuff like this. And then even to the point where they can do teleconnect. So the, the nurses are becoming like case manager um, and tele nurses um, or on-call nurses for those patients. Does that make sense, Laura? Yes, it does. But it's because when, you know, you, you told us that the push is by 2025, that's just down the street, you know, three, three years to come yep. by. And 50% are going to be home on home dialysis. 30% are going to be hopefully tra transplant patients. So you're reduce, or we're, we're, the hope is to reduce the people that need hemodialysis to only one in five or so, correct? So I'll say, that, I'll say that's in the long term, but like that, we're talking about the incidence. That 80% is incidence, not prevalence. So we're talking about new starts, 2025. Everybody who's on dialysis already, that's not really incorporated into that mix. So, so it's kind of like the 2.0. It's like, okay, moving forward, home is going to be the first option for patients unless they're like not a qualified candidate. But it's going to be the, the like, this is the way we do dialysis moving forward. You, you have kidney failure, you can be trained to do it at home or your spouse can do it. I had a question. Um, I'm curious. Um, with the dialysis, I know that they sometimes, I, I see when they bring in the machines and they're setting up and everything, but do they have 24-hour dialysis at the hospitals since it's 24 um, hours? Yes. They, they do, oh. um, but sometimes it depends on the hospital. So like a, a, an actual acute hospital that is an uh, um, uh, inpatient hospital, like a short term, mm -hmm. um, they will have 24 hours. If it's a long-term care, like a kindred hospital, it won't be 24 hours. Okay, I was curious if, about that. If, okay. if, if they, if they so, so like they'll set hours, right? And the way the hospital work is like that the dialysis company or the dialysis department will dialyze from this time to this time. If there's something after that, if it's an out service, like an uh, outsourced company, then there is a, a another rate. So they'll call a nurse in at midnight but the hospital is going to pay a much higher rate for that nurse. Oh, I see. But, I but see. it's not typical to say like, hey, we just do dialysis 24 hours a day. It's normally mm -hmm. between these hours and these hours. That's when we dialyze patients. And if a patient is admitted to the hospital that needs like, they call it a stat, like a, a stat mm -hmm. treatment, an immediate treatment, wow. then they'll call somebody in. They pay a much higher rate for that, uh, for that treatment. Okay. 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 All right. <laughs> All right, folks, have a great weekend, and uh, I'll see you on Tuesday. Text or call me if you need anything, okay? All right, and we have to finish our uh, two discussions and two... Um, two discussion, two replies, and then your 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 quiz as well. Before, before Sunday, before the end of Sunday, right? Before tonight. Before tonight, okay, sounds good. Yeah, I think, I think everybody's there. Maybe one person still needs to do a couple discussions but yeah get, get those in uh, by the way i was really impressed with your guys discussions um all of you who have chimed in so far it was uh thoughtful it was interactive um just make sure you keep it like keep it in your words keep it in your in your perception um like 100 percent paraphrase or 100 percent new content okay okay all right guys good Take care. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.